Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and good afternoon to all of our respected viewers of the Voice of the Clips YouTube page as well as the Voice of the Clips Facebook page. My name is Javier Adams and I'm a presenter here at the VOC and it gives me great honor and pleasure on behalf of the entire team here at VOC to be introducing our guest today as usual, alhamdulillah, it is none other than Brother Ibad Isaacs of the Futures Academy SA's online high school. And this is, of course, a collaboration between the Voice of the Cape as well as Futures Academy, where each and every year we have our annual program and that is the matric revision program dedicated to all of the matriculant students out there who are preparing for the trial examinations, inshallah. As usual, I encourage each and every one of you, our beloved viewers out there, those who have family and friends who are in matric now currently and who are doing the examinations, please share and forward this link, the YouTube link or the Facebook link with all of your fellow matriculants out there in the community in order that they may benefit from this beautiful revision program that the VOC is conducting in collaboration with Futures Academy, inshallah. Without further ado, we now hand over to Brother Imad Isaacs and he will be going through content for the subject of physical sciences, and this is in particular with reference to physical sciences paper one. The examination is up and coming, and of course, we always wish our matriculants the very best, inshallah, for their preparation for the exam, and we hope that you will benefit from the discourse of Brother Imam Isaacs, as he will be taking you through the content that you will have to prepare for, respected matriculants, for physical sciences paper one. Without further ado, we hand over to Brother Imam Isaacs to conduct the Respect the program, inshallah. Inshallah, shukran, brother Amir in the studio. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and good afternoon once again, almost evening. Uh, and welcome to our second session, I believe, for physical sciences. Now, uh, as we mentioned, we covered quite a bit of work in the first uh, session last week, Friday. And during that session, uh, during that session, we covered the importance of the examination guidelines. We took you through what the document looked like. We also showed you where you can find it on the uh, either the WCD or the DBE, the Department of Basic Education's website and the Curriculum National Senior Certificate. And then you go to the tab called Examination Guidelines. Okay. We also indicated why the exam guidelines are particularly important. It is like a scope that you get for the end of the year. In other words, there are no surprises coming to you in your final examination, okay? So that's number one. Number two, also definitions. We also covered definitions where you saw that the questions related to direct recall, the very simple questions in which you, you find that they ask you to define or to state or to name the phenomenon and so forth, those questions add up to anywhere between 15 to 18 marks in the national examination. So anywhere between 10 and 12%. Uh, that's in the bag. Okay. And then from there, we then moved forward looking at specifically graphs and how graphs is a skill in the national examinations. And we also touched a little bit of, upon, um, or rather, we touched a little bit on the potential reasons as to why learners may actually underperform in the examinations. And we said when it comes to physical sciences, it's merely my opinion that there's one of two main reasons. It's either a poor conceptual understanding, it's where we don't really know the physics or what's happening there. And uh, that's usually a quick fix because physics is fairly easy to grasp in terms of the science of the physics itself. The second part is the language of physics, which is essentially mathematics. So if learners have poor mathematical skills, then this also reflects in underperformance in the metric examinations. Okay, so we're going to continue this week uh, with our discussion around graphs and also looking at um, the importance of being able to read the various uh, things and uh, properties and, you know, just be able to work with graphs. Okay. So last week, we also touched on the types of graphs and seeing how they actually apply to things in the physical sciences. Uh, we could see that these are actually just graphs that come from our mathematics, uh, the straight line, the parabola, the hyperbola, an inverse square graph, the sine and the exponential. And then also, you know that you've covered uh, ellipses, uh, circles, as well as cubic graphs in your mathematics classes, but those are not necessarily common in physical science experiments. Okay. 
Then we touched on straight line graphs. We mentioned that we look at two things that never change in a straight line graph. That was the gradient and also the y-intercept, which is represented or denoted with m and c, and those were considered our constants. We then covered some things about gradients. We looked at equations of straight lines, and then we looked at this chi high example last week as well. And we had Isaac and Porfu, who sells chairs at home affairs, and he charges 10 rand to hire them with no other costs, and we saw what that type of graph looks like as well. Okay, right, and then we also indicated that if you had to look at that, if I want to know I want to hire 10 chairs, there's no other cost, it's only 10, uh, sorry, not 10 chairs, let's say 5 chairs at 10 rand each, it's going to be 5 multiplied by 10, and that's going to give us 50, so it's 10 rand times the number of chairs that we want to hire. That is essentially how we look at this relationship or this equation over here. And because the 10 is in front of a linear variable in the equation that we see over there, we can easily equate and observe that the 10 and the m, um, in other words, the gradient of this particular line will be that 10. Okay. Right, so we went on to a few other examples and we saw um, what the case would be if Isaac charged 8 Rand with no other costs. And we saw how the gradients compare from the 10 Rand one, it would be less steep. We then looked at, well, if he charges 8 rand per chair with a fixed cost irrespective of how many chairs you order there's going to be a y-intercept that is raised and then we also looked at the example that if he gives you the first chair free how the the y-intercept is you know decreases or moves downward okay at negative 15. so anyway those are things that we covered in the last lesson now the relationship that we were trying to make evident and apparent over here is the fact that these are just simple linear graphs, but you've also come across them in your physical sciences. So if you go to the physical sciences, we can see there's a graph representing Ohm's law. We can also see that 1 over r in this case is actually the gradient. Okay, And then because it's touching at the y-intercept and the origin, uh, we can see that the y-intercept is actually 0. In the next part, we can see Vf equals Vi plus A delta T. Clearly, the velocity is a function of time. In other words, the independent variable is your time in seconds, and the dependent variable is your velocity in meters per second. So in this relationship over here, in the second graph, we can clearly see that the coefficient of this linear variable, this delta t or this t that we have over here is just a, which is the acceleration. So the acceleration over here is actually the gradient of this particular graph. Okay. And then VI, what is VI? That's actually our y-intercept. So it's very important to make the relationship here between the maths and the physics. Now, in the last picture that we see over there, we've got energy measured in joules, um, the energy measured in joules versus the frequency in hertz. And as we can clearly see here, the equation there is H multiplied by F minus F naught. And when you multiply this out, you will see that I get HF, that's the energy, and I get minus HF naught, which is the threshold frequency. This is coming from your section on the photoelectric effect. And therefore, this negative HF naught is actually your, um, is actually going to be your, your y-intercept, and that's going to be the minimum energy, right? Um, that will be on the y-intercept, okay, which is negative HF naught. So anyway, at this point, the main thing we want to demonstrate to you is the fact that graphs should not be scary, should not be something that surprises you. It is fairly relatable from your mathematics class. Okay. Right. Look at the examples. And look at the examples here. Okay. And then we also use the, the, the example of the um, uh, a negative slope function that we had over here. We can see it's minus 2 multiplied by time. Now, if you remember the example... It is that um, we start off with 200 rands airtime. That's what we get every month. And then we use that airtime and it's charged at 2 rand per minute, right? And we measure the time in minutes for the purposes of the cell phone contract bill. And we see that the remaining airtime is actually 200 minus 2 times whatever we're using. And we could relate that once again to a physics example um, of the example of voltage versus current. And we can see the relationship there the initial voltage when there is no current flowing through the circuit actually relates to it being the maximum potential difference. That is the EMF. Okay. That is the EMF. 
Okay, moving forward, we then look at par uh, parabolas or quadratic graphs, ax squared plus bx plus c if you so wish. Um, in this case, the c value is zero. And also when we graph parabolas in physics, we generally graph them um, in the first quadrant, right? And why do we say in the first quadrant? Because we're not looking at negative time. Okay, so once again, if we look at the coefficients of the things that remain constant over here, the coefficient of t squared or delta t squared is a half a or a half acceleration. And the coefficient of delta t itself is going to be vi, okay? Now, coming back to this position time graph, things that we can quickly consider here, we covered previously in the last lesson as well. Um, if we are reading this and we're looking at position versus time, we can see that here the position away from a particular reference point is increasing uniformly. In other words, there is a constant velocity applied here, right? Here the position is standing still. Someone's position as time is going by, they're not moving away from the reference point nor towards it but rather they are standing still, right? So here uh, where the position remains constant, that's where we say there's actually zero velocity. So remember the two things that we're looking at. Here it's actually position versus time, but I'm also inferring certain information with respect to velocity uh, from this position versus time graph, okay? Okay, then Right. Now, after they're standing still, we see here that the position relative, as time continues, the position is decreasing. So again, we mean the position relative to a particular reference point. And then we find the two yellow dots. The two yellow dots over there indicate that um, we are standing on the same place, right? Because the position would be zero meters away from that particular reference point. And uh, finally, the green graph over here, if we compare that to the green graph, I'm sorry, the green graph compared to the red graph, when we compare these two gradients, red versus green, the dotted green line versus the solid red line, of course, since the position versus time is increasing so rapidly, Okay, um, yeah, sorry, my apologies. I had a, had a thought here outside of physics. <laughs> anyway, so the position versus time graph, uh, if we compare the two gradients, the red, red positive, um, sorry, the red solid line with the green dotted line over here or the intervaled line, we can find that this is a steeper gradient. And when this has a steeper gradient, it means that, of course, this velocity here will be faster or greater than the person's velocity that is represented by the red line, okay? And the reason for that is this person here with the green line is covering more distance in the same time unit as the person with the red line, okay? Then if we look at the two other curves, um, the purple and the blue, we can clearly state that the purple one here they're moving away fairly fast and then they move away slower and here they're going to move um, faster and then it's going slower and you measure that relative to how much distance or position where that position is um, with respect to time okay okay then Okay, let's move forward quickly. Velocity versus time graphs. Here yeah, we can clearly see that the velocity is a different um, between each of the intervals. Here yeah, the velocity is increasing over time. Here yeah, it remains constant. Here yeah, it's increasing. Here yeah, it's increasing at a faster rate relative to the rate of the year, which means that the acceleration for the first red line on the, to my left is faster than the acceleration um, to, the, to the right. Okay, and on the blue line, the acceleration is completely zero. Okay, the last thing we also covered in the last lesson, I know we've taken about 10 minutes to fully recap. The last thing that we covered over there was this R, um, yellow dot, which indicated that here the velocity at both points are zero, but does not necessarily indicate that the person is on the same position. So very important to know the differences between position time versus uh, the velocity time graphs 
and what each of them represent. Okay. Okay. Now, let's look at Let's look at the examples of what each of our graphs would look like. Position, velocity, and acceleration in each of the cases. And we're going to break this down. The first one is position versus time when motion is at constant velocity. Now, when motion is at constant velocity, we are well aware that that means at constant velocity, it means that there's zero acceleration. Right, so if I'm walking at two meters per second, I remain walking at two meters per second, and I don't go faster, right? I don't go faster. So let's look at the simulation quickly. We'll start with some initial velocity. We'll make our acceleration zero, and we'll see what that's going to lead to, or what that's going to look like with respect to time. So here the moving man is loading. And then we also just want to quickly compare the graphs. Okay, while that loads, let's talk about this in general. If you start with some velocity and you apply no acceleration, that means your velocity will remain constant, right? It will remain constant. Your acceleration, if there is zero acceleration, it means that as time progresses, my graph is going to simply lie on the x-axis. And as time progresses, because I'm walking or moving, right, or vehicle is moving, then with respect to position versus time, the position will also increase. Okay, so let's look at the example here from the moving man. Okay, so... Uh, let's bring up the charts quickly. And so there we have some graphs. Yes. Okay, that's awesome. We can make it bigger. Um, doesn't seem to change much, but yeah, we can at least make it bigger. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So let's see if we can place this man somewhere. We'll place him here at the beginning. Right, is starting there. Um, and we'll give him some initial velocity of one meter per second. And we have zero acceleration, right? And so now we want to see what's happening with the man. And you just ignore this, this portion here. Okay, look at what's happening with the graph over there. From this, uh, from this time we were recording over here, as you can see, the position versus time is increasing. And obviously, the position here was starting at minus 10, and that's why it started as minus 10. We can also see because the man is moving at a constant velocity, we see no acceleration. Therefore, acceleration is zero. Okay. Okay. So let's just say we start uh, the same position. And let's just make this a little bit greater so that we can... I got two meters per second with zero acceleration. And just look at those graphs. Here you can see the velocity remains constant because the man is moving at a constant velocity. You can also see the gradient here is a constant gradient, right? So in other words, your rise of run as you move per time unit, the distance from there to there, this distance from there to there, and each time unit will remain the same, okay? And as you can see, the acceleration is zero. So now... Okay, and there we can see what that graphs individually look like. Okay, that's okay. So going back to this, when the acceleration is zero and it's a constant velocity, my position time graph will look like the graphs that we find on screen. Okay, and again, velocity doesn't change. It stays in the same y value, and the x value here is just getting greater and greater and greater. And there we go. Okay, let's go to the next one. We bring back the moving man. 
And now we say there's some positive acceleration we want to observe and work with. And so if there's some positive acceleration, it means that our velocity graph will not remain constant, but rather the velocity will increase as time progresses. And then with respect to acceleration versus time, we will see that there is a positive acceleration, but the acceleration is uniform. It does not change. Okay. So in other words, it's constant acceleration. We're not slowing down and then, yeah. Okay, so let's clear quickly. Let's put the moving man here at the beginning again. Oops, I don't want to record. I want to clear that so that we don't confuse anybody. Let him start there at the beginning. Let's give him some initial velocity of uh, 0.5 meters per second. And let's give him some acceleration of one meter per second. Okay, so let's see what happens with the moving man. Okay. So we have some positive acceleration. And because there's some positive acceleration, it means that I'm starting to move faster and faster and faster and faster. So just watch the moving man over a couple of seconds. Okay. And look at that position versus time graph. Okay. Let's see if we can fit that over there. Okay, so our velocity time graph is going to be a positive straight line or positively slipped straight line. Our uh, acceleration graph, you can see it remains constant. So acceleration remained at one. This is going to look like that. And if we look at the position versus time graph, you can see it's going to be that, that upward curve. Okay, now if we were unsure because we're seeing here, the only reason you see this year um, below the axis is because this is our zero point. And so here to the left of the reference point that was um, below the reference point or to the left of the reference point that was the negative side and this is the positive side. So that's what the graph looks like there. If any of that confuses you, we can look at the moving man once again and place him at zero. Just want to clear. We're not necessarily recording what we're doing in terms of motion. Mm. and some initial velocity and one meters per second. Let's just pause that there quickly and clear. And one meters per second acceleration. Okay, and now we watch the moving man, starting at where we indicated our measurement would begin. Okay, and as the seconds are going by, you can see that the acceleration remains constant, but the velocity continues to change and increase because as time goes by, the velocity is increasing. Okay, so look at that, and there we go. Right, so, so there's our position time graph, there's our velocity, and here's our acceleration versus time. Okay, now we look at the negative acceleration. What's going to happen with negative acceleration? So in other words, we start with some velocity. Okay, we go to the moving man simulation once again. We're going to start with some velocity. I put the moving man right at the beginning. Um, let him start with six meters per second and let him decrease with maybe 1.5 meters uh, negative acceleration. So of course, negative acceleration here means they are decelerating or they are slowing down. And I'm just going to clear that. And now we watch what happens here. Okay, the position has to reach a a reference point, okay, up until such time that he gets to zero, okay. Now, once he reaches zero, you must remember, that's when things will turn around. So if you think of this in terms of vertical projectile motion, the position versus time graph will also look like this, because if you throw something up, there's going to be negative acceleration applied to it. If, or rather, let's not call it negative for that purpose, but let's say it has, they have downward acceleration. So if you have downward acceleration, whilst you're moving upward, that's going to oppose the motion. So once again, if you think of this, I've got this projectile, something I'm going to throw into the air within free fall. It's going to go up. It's going to reach a maximum height. It's then going to come down. Okay. So as it's going up, right? You release it with some initial velocity, but as it's going up, gravity is always going to be pulling that down. And as gravity is pulling that down, it's going to cause this to come to a standstill for a split moment in the air. And then it's going to come downward. 
And as it comes down, gravity is also pulling it down. So now you have the displacement or the motion in the same direction as the acceleration. And that's when it's going to start speeding up. Okay. So remember, we can isolate this graph to only look at certain parts. So if you start with negative acceleration, you're going to have a negative value for your acceleration throughout. And then you're going to have started with some initial velocity, which continues to decrease due to that negative acceleration. And then my position versus time is going to, it's going to increase, but then it's going to reach a certain point and then it's going to decrease or turn around after the velocity has reached zero. So you see when velocity is zero, this will be at the maximum point or maximum height or maximum distance, depending on what you are modeling. Okay, so there we have what this looks like. So of course, this was only graphed for a certain part. You can see at this point here where the person turned around. Look at the moving man once again. If we only isolate this part of the graph, um, let's just isolate that portion there. And just look at this. There is my increasing piece. That's going to reach till zero. And once again, my acceleration has remained constant, but it was a negative acceleration. Okay. Um, righto. So there's our moving man simulation. Now we go to that was neg uh, positive acceleration, negative acceleration. And then, of course, the very first one was there was no acceleration. Okay. Now, let's take us back to our grade 10 work. Once again, critically important. Um, Alia mounts her bicycle. This means basically she's getting on her bicycle and rides to work, right? She mounts her bicycle to ride to work. She pulls away from home and accelerates down the road when she remembers that she forgot to pack her spectacles. She slows down, turns around, and rides back home. Her journey can be represented graphically, okay? So here we've got a position time graph and we have a velocity time graph. We've got a little bit more um, going on here than, than in the... Um, we've got a little bit more here than in the in the in the previous snippet because here we're putting the things together right and let's look at how they compare um section from zero to two as you can see this is with respect to time and this is also with respect to time so we've measured the same interval zero to two two to four to uh, four to six six to eight eight to ten and ten to twelve the same intervals now as you can see over here um position versus time the position is increasing, they're moving away from the reference point, right? And you can see here, this happens to probably going to be three, okay? So that means they're going to be three meters away from a particular zero reference point that was selected, okay? And that's what would have been covered in the first, um, that's what would have been covered in the first a time interval, a time unit over there. Okay, if we look at the second portion, you can see between two and four, um, the velocity remains constant. So this doesn't mean the person stopped. It means that the velocity remained constant. So they're still moving, they're still walking, she's still riding or driving or whatever she's doing with the bicycle, but she's moving at a constant velocity. Here initially, you can see there's a slight curve, which means that the velocity was also increasing. Why? Because in each time unit, she's covering initially more distance, right, and then less distance. And then between B, uh, two to four, a velocity remains constant, and therefore she's covering the same distance in terms of her position versus time. Then here you can see her velocity is decreasing, right, till she reaches a point where her velocity is actually zero. Now, if you look at this, between four till six, the position continues to increase, but then it starts to plateau over there and there her position is 12 meters away from the reference point and now it's going less meters away from the reference point. Now, if we read what actually happens, she slows down, she turns around and rides back home. If we had to ask you, where did she slow down? Then you must be able to tell me she was slowing down between four and six seconds and that's area C, that's where she was slowing down, okay? Um, when did she turn it down? She turned it down at six seconds because here she was at the maximum displacement or distance away from a reference point and then it starts to decrease, which means she's getting closer to that reference point once again. And then from six to eight, we have this position D, 
right? And what's happening over here is her velocity is increasing. However, she's moving in the opposite direction. So remember the sign here, it's only indicating the vector quantity to indicate that velocity is moving back towards that reference point. Okay, she's turned around. If we said initially she's starting moving to the right, then after six seconds, she's now moving towards the left. So let's say she started at zero, now minus one, 1 1.5, negative one, negative two, negative three. When we are at a constant velocity of minus three meters per second, that means it's moving at three meters per second towards the left, assuming that initially we were riding towards the right. Okay, then once again, between E, we have the exact um, constant velocity over there. So she's still moving because it's a velocity time graph. She's still moving, but she's moving at a constant velocity. And then over here in section F, she is, uh, a velocity is decreasing, okay? And she eventually reaches a zero velocity after 12 seconds. So you can clearly say, if I had to ask you, when did she forget? When did she realize that she forgot her spectacles? Then you'd say somewhere here between four and six seconds is when she realized, and that's when she is exactly slowed down. When did she turn it around? That will be at six seconds, okay? Which areas did she have a constant velocity? Where was she riding with uniform velocity? That's going to be between two and four seconds and between eight and 10 seconds, okay? When was the velocity zero? After six seconds and once again after 12 seconds. So there's two times that she stopped as well as just before she started riding. Okay. Okay, that indicates the turning point. Now, here we've added something. From the velocity versus time graph, we can also see the acceleration, right? When we say that your velocity is getting greater and increasing between zero and three meters per second, greater, 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 velocity is increasing. That means you're moving faster. That means that there is some kind of acceleration. And in this case, that acceleration is positive. Okay. Now, if that acceleration is positive, it's represented by this straight horizontal line represented for section A. Then, when the velocity remains constant, that means you're not slowing down, nor are you speeding up, then the, the acceleration will be zero. And that's represented by this line here, the B part of the graph. Now between C and D, the acceleration is negative. Now sometimes this throws students off, right? Now how do I know this is negative acceleration? Well, I'm moving in the positive direction, but my, so if I think of the vector, Okay, if I think of the vector, um, I'm moving in the positive direction, but I'm slowing down, which means my acceleration is opposite to my direction of motion, right? Meaning that's going to be negative acceleration. Now, between C and D, I still have negative acceleration, which just indicates the direction of that acceleration. However, I'm actually speeding up. And the reason I'm speeding up is that my acceleration is in the same direction as my displacement. Between four and six seconds or area C that we have over here, my acceleration is opposite to the direction of motion, right? Because the direction of motion is positive, my acceleration is negative. Hence, I am actually slowing down. But between six and eight seconds, my acceleration is in the negative direction, but my displacement is also in the negative direction, and therefore I'm going to be speeding up. So if that doesn't make complete sense, because sometimes it does throw students off thinking about this, I want to quickly look at this moving man chart again. We start the moving man over there, and um, we're going to say he's got some initial velocity of, say, six meters per second with a negative acceleration of minus one. And it's going to start over there, and we're going to clear the graphs for now. And what I want you to notice is I want you to see the vectors. Mm. Let's see. Let's see if there are vectors somewhere here. Ah. Okay. That man is not doing anything. 
but for some reason or the other, I am pretty sure I imagine that we would have some vectors. Okay, let's give you one quickly where we can show you some vectors. Um, simulation projectiles. Okay. Right, so, so let's look at what we've got over here. Um, Okay, I'm looking for a button where there must be the word show vectors, but for some reason or the other, I don't see the word show vectors here, but let's not stress. Um, hmm. So sorry, guys. I might just be a little bit blind here on screen. Uh, I don't, ah, there we go. There's the button. I'm so sorry. I see the button now. Okay, now we go back to the charts and we can do something with the man. And let's just see if we... Hmm. Uh, let's just do it over here. Okay, let's do it here. And we start the man over there somewhere, right? And let's just press clear. I seem to have found some vectors. And I want you to remember what you learned about vectors. Two things. A vector is represented by an arrow. The length of the vector indicates the magnitude. In other words, that's how much velocity or um, the actual absolute value of the position. And the arrow indicates the direction. Okay, so we're starting over here. We're going to give the man the initial velocity of six meters per second. And uh, okay, let's make it. Let's make it four meters per second. So you can see that vector. Do you see that velocity vector? And now let's make the acceleration negative. Uh, one meter per second, and let's make this six, let's make this five. Okay, so now look at this. That means the man's moving towards the right, but his motion is being opposed by his acceleration over here because his acceleration is the opposite direction, hence he's going to slow down. So you see there, over time he slows down and his velocity vector tends to decrease. His velocity vector becomes zero, and then what happens to the man? His velocity vector and his acceleration is in the same direction, okay? Do you see that? So that's actually what's happening. Let's look at it again quickly. Make that five meters per second, make this negative 1.5 for the acceleration. Okay. And you see it's constant acceleration, but understand what that means. And now if we go back to our example over here, this is what we mean between four and six seconds, the acceleration vector remains a negative acceleration. However, between six and eight seconds, that negative um, uh, acceleration is in the same direction as that negative displacement, hence causing an increase in the velocity. Okay, once again, the velocity is constant between eight and 10, and you can see the, uh, the velocity remains constant, therefore the acceleration is zero. And here you can see they are decreasing the speed or the velocity, however, because you're moving towards, let's say, the left, in terms of that moving man that we saw over there, then we can consider the acceleration here to be towards um, the velocity here is going to decrease. Why? Because um, the acceleration will be positive. Right? So think of it, the acceleration is once again in the opposite direction to the direction of motion here. Okay. So now here's some quick work for you. The work that you need to do, the work that you need to do, um, this is an extract also from Dr. Fisher's work, uh, is to quickly draw what motion at constant velocity would look like. Okay, what would motion at constant velocity look like? So let's give you one minute for that quickly.
okay so motion at constant velocity remember motion at constant velocity here will look like that right straight line uh, sorry that's on me okay some positive velocity if it's constant it's going to be one horizontal line that looks like that and then the acceleration, if it's constant velocity, remember that your acceleration is going to be zero, right? So that's going to run just on your x-axis, okay? Then for positive acceleration, right? We looked at these graphs a moment ago. For positive acceleration, remember we start, let's say we start with no velocity, but the acceleration is positive. So the acceleration graph is the easiest to draw because it's a constant, but it's positive. Then the velocity is going to look like this. For that same acceleration and then your position time graph is going to look like this okay and there we go now for negative acceleration let's look at the negative acceleration example what this means is for negative acceleration let's just take uh, an example a trolley is launched uphill up a runway rolling back from the top so if you had to find an analogous example of some motion that's represented by that, you could say a projectile that is launched from a certain height and returns to that same height. Okay, So that projectile, if it's launched from a certain height and returns to the same height, oops, it's going to, um, sorry, what's happening to my marker here? Let's, let's start with the velocity, right? So if we start with the velocity, it's launched from uphill. So in the same way that if I had to throw this up, this pin up, then I'm going to say that I look at my system as being just from the moment it leaves my hand because there's going to be some initial velocity if I launch it. And that's going to be some positive, okay? And we're saying this is negative acceleration. So the example of the negative acceleration will be a constant negative acceleration like that. Okay, this over here, I'm sorry, that must be a complete horizontal line. Forgive me if it's slightly increasing there. That's, that should not be how it's done. Okay, and we start with some velocity. We reach a point of zero, and then we, and then we increase, right? So let's run that to the same point. And then the distance away from a reference point will increase until it reaches a maximum distance away from that reference point and then starts to, to return to the reference point. Okay, and so that's what our um, position time graph will look like. Okay, now we come to something a little bit more interesting. Okay, the interesting part is let's talk about a bouncing ball. So here, if they had to give you an analogous example, it says a trolley rolls down a sloping runway, it bounces back repeatedly off the bottom. Okay, so it's launched from a certain point. So what will that look like for its velocity? Okay, it's going to look like this, right? And then you're going to get, uh, let's put it there, and then you're going to get this thing here. Okay, now what's important to note is that this part here, if you look at this example all the way, right? All the way, remember there's still uniform acceleration, except for a split moment. So there's negative acceleration, that's over here, is a split moment that you're going to find something like that, right? And then the acceleration continues negatively. Okay, that's, that's a little bit messy. But what I wanted to point out is the following. If you look at that second part of this graph, the second part that you see over here, hmm, the second part that you see over here, Hey, Bo, what's going on? Ah, I'm so sorry. I can only stick in red. That's what I was trying to change. But if you look at the second part of the graph, it merely looks like this part of the graph. So what we're saying here is this, this could even have modeled this, this situation or scenario that you see over here, but you're working with a different system. And to help you out there, what is a system? A system is an imaginary part of the world that you isolate in order to study it, right? So what I'm saying here is if you look at the second part of this graph, this actually here, the second part of this graph 
is really this entire portion of this entire graph that you find on this side. Okay, let's go and spend the last 15 to 20 minutes that we have uh, focusing on um, focusing on some graph questions. Okay, so the exemplar 2014 is one question that we find over here. There's a question that we have over there that we can look at shortly. All right, there's a question there. We're going to come to that question. And we're going to look at the specific questions related to graphs from each of these. Right. Okay, that's coming from November 2018. And this question, which is November 2019. So let's look at, and then there's November 2020. So let's focus just on the graphs questions coming from here. Um, and let's just quickly... Change the size of the whiteboard just a little bit. Okay. Hmm. Okay. There we go. I think that's a little bit better. I just want to quickly remove the pen. Okay, so let's look at our first question. Let's take the question from the exemplar 2014. Um, it's asking for the maximum height reached uh, by a ball of mass 0 0.5 kilograms projected vertically upwards. Okay. Um, sorry, a ball of mass 0 0.5 kilograms projected vertically up, uh, vertically downwards towards the ground from a height of 1.5 meters at a velocity of 2 meters per second. Okay. So when they say it's projected vertically, it's a key word that we look out here for. It's not dropped. If they use the word drop, then you know that it has an initial velocity of zero. But here it's projected vertically downwards, which means it's like it's kind of thrown downwards, right? Towards the ground from a height of 1.8 meters at a velocity of 2 meters per second. The position time graph of the motion of the ball is shown below. So here you can see there's the position time graph. Now what's actually happening here is that there's a ball, right? It's thrown down. And you can see it's thrown down from 1.8 meters. When it's zero meters above the ground, then you know that that D is for a split moment that it's in contact with the ground. And then the second motion that you find over here is where that ball is bouncing. Okay, so here it's thrown down. Here it's its first bounce, then reaches a maximum height. It then comes down and it bounces again. So there's two bounces that takes place. Once thrown down, so this is the motion, down, up, down, up again, so double bounce, okay? And with each consecutive bounce, we find that the distance of the maximum height with each bounce changes. Now, let's go to the first question very quickly. Remember our focus is on graphs, and we can see over here, what is the maximum vertical height reached by the ball after the second bounce? So you need to observe that here it's thrown down, here it bounced once, and then here it's the second bounce. So question 3.1, the answer is going to be naught. 0.5 maximum height, vertical height reached after the second bounce. It's this part of the year, 0.5 meters, right? Then question 3.2, question 3.2 says, calculate the magnitude of the time T1 indicated on the graph. Now, what we're going to do there is we're not really going to calculate T1 um, because I'm focusing on graphs and that actually relates to equations. However, when you had to solve a question like that, Remember, you represent the system, okay? So if you want to calculate T1, you simply draw a system, and the system is going to look like this. You put down V initial. You put down V final. Um, you indicate G. You indicate the displacement, and you choose a reference system, right? The displacement is delta Y. It's going to be negative 1.8. This is going to be negative 9.8, and you want time, and you don't have... Um, and you have VI. 
So you have VI, which is going to be downward. So let's just say our system downward. Let's assume our system downward is negative and our system upward is positive. Then we're going to say VI is minus two. I apologize for the lack of meters per second there. Ah, minus two, okay. So minus two meters per second. This is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. This is going to be minus 1.8. And we don't have final velocity and we don't have time, right? So the question is, if you have to solve that question, how do you choose a formula? Well, you know you've got four equations of motion. You don't look at what you have because you don't have time for that in an examination. You look at what you don't have. So I want time, but I don't have, um, I don't have V final. So in other words, to answer this question, you probably have to do two calculations. Um, because all the equations actually have V final in, so you must find V final uh, using one of the other equations that don't have time, and then you apply any of the easiest equations, right? But anyway, let's just give you the solutions there quickly. Your V final is equal to negative 6, 27. Negative 6, 27 meters per second, right? And then you find time and you'll find that the time value is 0, 0,44 seconds. Okay, so we did essentially start with a little bit of the more trickier one. The velocity with which the ball rebounds from the ground during the first bounce. So if you, again, you draw a system like this, but now your system is not gonna be that portion, it's going to be this portion. You will have your V final, you'll have your G, you'll have the displacement, which you also read from the graph. And in this case, after solving that, you're going to find that 3.3, the initial velocity, of course, will be, um, they said, the velocity which the ball rebounds from the ground. So the velocity is going to be 4.2 meters per second, right? And because they said velocity, we say upwards. Okay. Now, question 3.4. It's not really our focus here. Okay, because we want to focus on that during equations. We've only worked at 3.1 to 3.3 for the purposes of doing question 3.5. Now, what are we going to put in in 3.5? Well, 3.5, if we read the question, it says draw a velocity time graph for the motion of the ball from the time that it is projected to the time when it rebounds to a height of 0 0.9. So they're asking you to draw the motion only for this section, right? Only up until here, right? Only up until, until there. This is the motion that you must draw it for. So let's see, if we draw that, what will we have? We will have, because acceleration remains constant, remember your gradients here are going to be constant. Also important to note, the gradients are going to be negative. Why? Because um, we've considered upward as positive and downward as negative. And because the gradient here is gravity, it's going to be negative. So let's see what 3.5's question is going to look like. Right, I draw my graph. They asked me to draw velocity versus time graph. So important to indicate what's being measured on each part of the graph. So this is going to be the velocity in meters per second. And then this here is velocity versus time. Time is measured in seconds. Okay. Right, so there's some initial velocity that gets greater and greater. And just because it's being projected downwards and because also the acceleration is in the same direction of that velocity. So I'm going to start over there, and then I'm going to go to T1. So this initial velocity over here is going to be minus 2, right, because it was projected with a negative 2. And then at this point here, this is going to be my 0 0.44 seconds. I'm just going to put a, a line like that, okay, because there is some gap over there. So there's going to be some gap over there. And then this point here that we indicate is 0, 0,44 seconds because after 0, 0,44 seconds, that's when T1 was, was met. And then there's going to be some kind of rebound where this point over here is actually your T2. And then that's where it reaches its maximum height at 0 0.9 meters. And at the maximum height we know for projectile, the velocity will equal to zero. So uh, that's not correct, but this is a bit more correct, right? Okay. And then this year will be that 
corresponding to that time that's over there. Let's just call this alpha or cow or chicken, and you can then make it alpha cow or chicken over there. Okay, so that's what our graph would look like. So question there, three marks, 2% easy marks, right? Remember, there are quite a number of graphs that you can find in the question paper. Let's go to the next one quickly, another uh, graph example. Uh, what can we see in this example over here? Um, right here. So this is another fairly easy one. And in this question, it's asking us to give them the, uh, I'm looking, sorry, just at question four. But let us quickly read the full question, right? Because the thing you must also be accustomed to do doing is reading the question. So, in a competition, participants must attempt to throw a ball vertically upwards past point T, marked on a tall vertical pole. So we get that idea. Competition, want to throw the ball upwards. The aim of the game is to throw it past point T. Point T is 3.7 meters above the ground. So we actually know the distance or displacement from the ground to point T. Point T may or may not be the highest point during the motion of the ball. Okay. Because if somebody throws it up, they might throw past point T. One participant throws the ball vertically upwards at a velocity of 7.5 meters per second from a point that is 1.6 meters above the ground, okay, as shown in the diagram below. Ignore the effects of air resistance. In which direction is the net force acting on the ball while it moves towards point T? Choose upwards, downwards, and give a reason for your answer. So in which direction is the net force acting on the ball? So what is the net force? So remember what the definition of free fall is or what we know to be a projectile. It's when we throw something up in the air and the only force acting on it is gravity. So if the only force acting on something that is um, in free fall is gravity, then we clearly know that gravity is pulling that thing downwards. And gravity is thus then the net force, right? So the 3.1, fairly simple, downwards because gravity is the only thing acting on it. 3.2, calculate the time taken for the ball to reach its maximum height. Now, once again, if you get a question like that for that guy, you draw a system. Now, this could be made up of multiple systems. For example, if I draw the ball, it's going to go upwards like that. It reaches a maximum height, and then it comes downwards. What this essentially means is I'm sitting with two systems. And remember the definition of a system that we gave you earlier. A system is an imaginary part of the world that we isolate in order to study it. So our system over here is going to have some V initial, and we know that we choose a reference point. Upwards, we will select as positive for our purposes here, downward as negative. And then if we say VI is equal to uh, 7.5 meters per second, right? Um, v final, you know it's going to reach a maximum height of 0 meters per second. G is going to equal to minus 9,8 meters per second, right? Delta T is something I don't think we have because they ask you for the time. And then we know that the last thing here is actually the displacement, delta y, right? Which will be some kind of a positive value. Now, you choose a formula based on what you don't have. And in this case, we want time. We don't have delta y. So you select a formula. You select a formula that does not contain delta y. And in this case, for question 3.2, the appropriate formula you'd select is v final is equal to... V I delta T A, right? So um, V final is equal to V initial plus, hey, what is that? V initial plus A or G delta T, right? In this case. Now we've got that. Um, we've got that. We've got that. And you solve for that. And we will find that delta t, the rest is just simply plug and play. Delta t was equal to 0, 0.77 seconds. Okay. Now we go to 3.3. Um, determined by means of the calculation whether the ball will pass point t or not. Now, again, the next question is based on once you have t, you can easily find delta y, right? Because you know how long it takes. So you now know you can solve what distance this would travel and delta y's distance. I'm giving you the solution only because our focus is on graphs and I want to get to the graph question here. But delta t is, uh, sorry, delta y is 2,87 meters. And that's the distance that we are looking at from this point up to there. So now you say, therefore, 
2,87 plus the 1.6. Um, 1.6 is equal to 4,47, right? Meters. Now, if that's 4,47, we know that 4,47 is greater than 3.7. Hence, it will pass point T. Yes, it will pass. Okay. Now, let's go down quickly. Let's look at the actual question which relates to graphs. And we had to get some of those calculations out of the way because we intend to use them in answering the graph question. Draw velocity time graph for the motion of the ball from the instant it is thrown upwards until it reaches its highest point. So now we want a velocity versus time graph from the instant, right? Velocity versus time. Now, if we, we've selected upwards as positive, right? So my velocity versus time graph, once again, velocity in meters per second versus time in seconds. For this motion, the ball has gone from there, some initial velocity, vi, has got some positive value. V final is equal to some zero value. And we know that the gradient is a negative 9.8, so it will have a slope sloping downwards. So if you draw that graph, what will it look like? It's simply going to be a, a, a downward sloping graph for that portion of the motion, right? So it's starting at 7.5 meters per second, 7.5, and then it stops at zero, and that's after this time. And that time, if you indicate the time on there, that's of course going to be 0, 0,77 seconds. Okay. We don't have seconds in there because it's already indicated time in seconds. So they say indicate the following, the initial velocity on the graph and the final time taken to reach its highest point. So when you have the graph, they will give you, maybe examiner gives you, one mark for both um, intercepts and then one mark for the shape, right? Um, to show that it's a constant gradient. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Um, and for this question, for this question over here, what's important to note for this question, let's read the question quickly. What does the question ask? Which of the labels A to H? Which of the labels A to H? Um, which of the labels A to H on the graphs above represent each of the following? Okay. So once again, please make sure you read the questions. Don't jump to doing what I just did, which is something the students do. Um, Right, the graphs of position versus time for part of the motion of both stones are shown below. Okay, so in other words, there are two stones. There's a part of this question that is missing, and I do apologize for that. Let's just see the first part is there. It's not there. Okay, so what we need to note here is that there are two stones that are thrown, right? One that goes up from a certain height and then reaches a maximum height, then comes down. Then there's another stone that it looks like is just dropped from a certain height. Okay. Now, the question is, which of the labels A to H on the graph represents each of the following? The time at which stone A has a positive velocity, the time when stone B was dropped, the maximum height reached by stone A, and the height at which the stones pass each other. Now, guys, when you read that question, when you read that question, Read very, very carefully, right? 3.5.1 and 3.5.3 .3 ask you about using the letters A until G or H, but they're asking you about time. So if you look at this, look very carefully at this. That says time, and this says time, right? And then if you look at 3.5.2, it says height, and here it says height. Now, the heights are represented by positions. So in other words, your options A until C, those are your options. A, H, B, and C, those are heights. Okay, so you select from these to answer question 3.5.2, 
a 3.5.4. Then you look at D until G to answer question 3.5.1 and 3.5.3. Okay, so let's, let's read the questions quickly. The time at which stone A has a positive velocity. The time at which stone A has a positive velocity. Now, when they say time, your options here are D and E, or you can say from D until E, okay? Or you can say D until E. Okay, so let's start there. 3.5.1's answer. We'll conclude on this question in a moment. It's going to be D because you can see it has a positive velocity. Okay, it's positive. There it's going to go to zero at the maximum height and then it's going to come down and that's where the, the height changes, velocity is changing. Okay, then 3.5.3, the time at which stone uh, B was dropped. Okay, what do you think the time at which D was dropped? So again, B was dropped. You can see the motion of B starts there with a height of B, but a time of F, right? A time of F. Okay. So for 3.5.3, we can list F. Now let's look at question 3.5.2. We've already indicated the maximum height reached by the stone. Well, the maximum height reached by the stone will occur at A, and that is fairly, fairly straightforward. And then for 3.5.4, the height at which the stones pass each other. And so in other words, that's where they have a common height. So you need to look at the point of intersection between the two graphs. This is the one graph, and this is the other graph. So this, this one is stone A, this is stone B, but at point, this intersection of the coordinates of C and G, that is where they, um, that is where they pass each other. Now, they didn't ask you for the time. If they asked you for the time, you would say G, but they are other, they asked you for the height. So at that point, you're going to say that height is going to be C. Okay, so there we go. This question that was fairly sim simple in the November 2019 examination covers four marks relating to, to um, graphs. And you can clearly see that that four marks is more than that four marks is more than 2%, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's lesson and session for physical sciences. Um, we hope that it was useful. In the next lesson, we'll look at um, some more graph qu uh, questions, but particularly focusing on two of the mechanics sections. And that's how we will tend to, to work towards um, uh, wrapping up and building up that collection of marks for the final examination. It's been a pleasure. Have an excellent weekend. And thank you very much. Over to you, Amir, back in the studio. We say shukran, jazakallah khair, and bayi terima kasih, thank you very much, to Brother Imar Isaacs, who so beautifully gave over the preparation for the Physical Sciences Paper 1. I think this was more than likely our longest session, mm -hmm. and I noticed that the Physical Sciences and Maths sessions are the longest on A, alhamdulillah, or rather online, when we're having the sessions. And I hope that each and every one of our matriculants that are taking their time out to prepare will be using this, inshallah, only for their benefit in the preparation of the final NSC exams and most certainly the mock examinations, the trial examinations, which this preparation is mostly aimed at. We hope that each and every one have benefited, inshallah. And as a reminder, once again, please, for all of those who are tuning in, who are not in matric, but who have matriculants who are amongst your friend circle or amongst your family members, please do share this link with them, inshallah, in order that they may benefit, and at least that all the matriculants may benefit from this discourse, and that they will be able to prepare adequately
for the up and coming trial examinations and of course the NEC examinations like at the end of the year once again. We say Shukran, thank you very much. Jazakallah khair to Brother Imad for giving mm -hmm. over physical sciences paper one today, the preparation therefore. And of course, thank you very much Shukran and Baitra Makasi to each and every one of you, our beloved viewers, for tuning in. We hope you have benefited greatly. And inshallah, next week we will continue on further with the sessions for the matric exam preparations. Inshallah, till next week, we wish you all very well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.